Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Everybody, welcome to the Environmental Communication Seminar and the Program on the Environment. I know you all know where you are, but uh, folks online might. Um, my name is Sean McDonald, and I'll be the host for the seminar today. We've got a fantastic speaker. Carol Roshana Williams is with us, artist and founder of the BIPOC Sustainable Tiny Art House Community. Let's go ahead and give Carol a big round of applause. So Williams uh, addresses, through her work, Williams addresses environmental issues such as the climate crisis through the lens of racial and inequalities. Um, before I go any further, uh, as is our custom, I wanna start by uh, doing the land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people land. Um, I'm joining from, the, as we are joining from the Seattle campus on the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish to Lalith and Muckleshoot nations. And uh, you know, I think it's important for us all just to sort of take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving the relationships between nations, to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. And it, since this is an environmental communication seminar, I think it's important to, to note that beyond that being just a symbolic gesture, I think there's a deeper meaning uh, that we should all consider. And, try to take action whenever and however we can. So before I go any further, just as a reminder, uh, our speaker will uh, speak for roughly 30, 40 minutes or so, and then we can jump into the Q&A. So I, I hope that folks in the audience here and online have questions for her. Folks on the Zoom, if you wouldn't mind just raising your little digital hand um, and hopefully maybe turning on your camera you could ask the questions for yourselves, or you could type them into the chat, and we can go ahead and ask, ask those questions on your behalf. I think that uh, Jess and Mel will be monitoring that. All right. So I uh, just want to give you a little bit more information about our speaker before we get started. Top by international photographer and artist Bob Hoft and international artist Kuro Kawasaki, faculty for the Evergreen State College. Carol Roshana Williams' work has a strong conception, has a strongly conceptual organic trajectory. Images that are genderless, spiritual, yet earthy seem to evoke tragedy and hope at the same time. Carol has explored large-scale social impact art installations created with a human-centered design and focused on topics that address race, equity, and climate justice. She has a BA in Advanced Studio Fine Arts and an MA degree in Organizational Development with an emphasis in diversity and leadership, which I think is a really interesting combination. Her work is in collections at the City of Seattle, the Evergreen State College, and numerous other institutions and homes in the Pacific Northwest. And so with that, I'd once again like to go ahead and give Carol Roshana Williams a big round of applause. Carol, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to speak with you guys. Um, this is like one of my major passions to talk about art and how it relates to um, not only the environment, but life itself, right? <laughs> and why why would people do art? Um, so my name is Carol Roshana Williams. I go by Carol Roshana. Um, and I use my middle name just because if you Google Carol Williams, you will not find me. There are numerous hundreds and thousands of me just in Washington. Um, my art focuses on race, environmental justice, um, and social justice. And just recently, I've really recognized, and I'll tell the story as I go through the slides, um, my work is transitioning deeply into spiritual practice. Um, although it's always been a spiritual practice, I don't know that I've seen it that way for a long time, but recently that's where, that's where I'm headed. Um, yeah, so that's who I am. Let's go to the next slide. Oops. So I was born in Kansas, um, and as soon as I was born, I was probably like nine or 10 months old, we moved to Germany. My uh, father was in the military. My mother um, was a stay-at-home mom, and she started her own catering business um, in Germany. And so I grew up in Germany for about 11 and a half years, 12 years of the first half of 
first half of my life was spent in Germany on a military base. Um, and then we moved to Waukegan, Illinois for about a year. And then my mother and I settled in Washington and Tacoma, where I graduated, went to middle school and high school, and then um, eventually ended up going to uh, college in Olympia at the Evergreen State College. When I started out doing art, I literally started out at five years old. Um, I was on a trajectory to be um, a famous musician, actually. My mother, her passion was the violin and orchestra music and symphony music and, and country music, which is so odd. Um, but her dream was that I would become a professional violinist. And so she started giving me violin lessons at the age of five, which um, is looking back was my first art gig, right? <laughs> um, and I don't talk a lot about the music part of side of my art just because um, I, I always felt like it was my mother's passion, but what I want to say about that and why I bring it up and why I think it's so important to my art practice is because um, I was born premature by almost two and a half months. And so I was very small and my mother used to carry me around on a pillow for probably, God, the first half of my life, first year of my life. And um, I stayed in the house a lot as a kid because I was very sickly. and so. Um, not having a lot of exposure to a lot of kids the first half of my life was um, very isolating to say the least. Um, but because we lived on an army base in the middle of the woods, um, I was able to actually spend a lot of time around trees, large, because they're, they're um, their scenery and foliage is very similar to Washington and so is the climate. And so I actually, lived in an old growth forest. That's where the base was situated. And so I became very accustomed to um, being in and around the environment at a very young age. Um, so with that, I once we came to my mother and my father separated when I was like 12 and a half. And so we ended up moving to my mother and I ended up moving to Tacoma and um, I played the violin until I think 11th grade when I decided that uh, it wasn't my dream and it was my mother's dream that I was going to do something different. Um, I was the student that was in Upward Bound. Um, I was a high achiever and I literally didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I was going to go to school for. I had no idea um, where I was headed. I And where I grew up in Tacoma, um, there was a lot of... Um, violence. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where there were bloods. The, the Crips and the Bloods were always fighting. It was in the 80s when Tacoma was always on the news. There was always gang violence. Um, and I had three friends. One committed suicide and two were murdered because of gang violence. And so um, I tell you this because the first half of my life was um, I had various experiences in terms of uh, economic and also uh, cultural in terms of being able to see a side of being African-American without being in the United States, right? Um, so I went to German schools and didn't really understand race. I didn't really understand um, social economic structures in America. Um, and it took me a really long time to, to, to decipher all of that, probably until I was like 35, maybe even 40. Um, and so a lot of my early work um, has a lot to do with self, um, self reflection, self healing. Um, I started out doing a lot of technical work. So really tight, um, photogenic types of work. A lot of my work is, um, androgynous. So it's not necessarily always a female or a male, um, by traditional standards. Um, I consider myself by, um, non-binary. And so I paint a lot of stuff that happens to, um, be very, uh, neutral figures. Um, 
And so what you see on the screen right now is this is some of my early work. The plague is, is a recent work, but I just showed that because I was, I was, I'll talk about that one a little bit later. I just showed that one because I have the violin in my hand. I did end up going back to the violin, which is funny. And it took me a long time, but um, I went back 2020 when COVID hit. <laughs> like I'm gonna need something to do I might as well uh, start playing the violin again um so this is some of my earlier work I ended up in Washington um so then I ended up going to the Evergreen State College um I actually finished high school a quarter early and I was adamant that I wasn't going to college I moved out of my mom's house um and I got a one bedroom with my best friend and I was just gonna party like for the next five years. And so my counselor at Upper Bound was like, you need to go to school. You need to, you need to get an education, right? And I was like, well, I don't want to. So she forced me to apply to three different colleges and I did, I got into all three and then I chose Evergreen. Um, and then when I went to Evergreen the very first year, um, I was one of maybe eight people of color on campus. And um, at the time, they did not have um, the student of color office. They didn't have um, systems in place to actually uh, work with students of color um, and acclimate them to the climate and the culture, especially as a first generation college student. Um, and so my first year at Evergreen, I excelled academically, but in terms of socially and, and um, culturally, it was very difficult for me. So I ended up dropping out of school. Um, I decided I was going to come to Seattle and party. <laughs> so I came to Seattle. I moved in with my boyfriend and my best friend and her boyfriends. And then, of course, uh, got pregnant. <laughs> um, and decided that I was going to keep my son and uh, that I was going to roll, I was going to try to go to school in Seattle. So I got into the Art Institute and then I dropped out because I was so sick. I was so pregnant. I was so sick. Um, so then after I had my son, I decided I was going to try again. So then I decided to go to Seattle Central. And actually, I went to Seattle Central for an entire year. Um, and all I took was art classes because I was curious about drawing and I was curious about painting. And it was the first time I actually like took um, an art class. Uh, and my professor was like, you should look into doing art. And I was like, yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, I don't know. And then I did research on the graphic illustration program. And then um, I was like, okay, we'll see. So I got into the graphic illustration program and the very first day of class, I was pulled out of class and basically told that I couldn't go to school there. And I, I was like, why? And they told me that my loan at Evergreen State College had been, um, um, gone into default. And so I would have to pay my loan off before I went back to school. So then I packed up my stuff. I went home to Tacoma um, and got a job at Head Start. It was like one of my second first real jobs um, as a teaching assistant. And I just decided that I was going to spend some time. I spent the next two to three years paying off my student loan. And then I decided I was going to go back to Evergreen and just finish because I had already done a year there and I could transfer the year from Central. So I wouldn't be there that long. <laughs> Um, and so then when I went back to Evergreen, I realized that from my experience at Seattle Central, um, I, I wasn't, I was, I was really, art for me became an outlet to understand and deal with the way that I grew up. And so it became an outlet for me to really um, express myself in a way that I was not allowed to express myself in my own community. Um, and so when we start thinking about environment, I'd like people to like broaden their sense of what environment means, right? So um, a lot of my work talks about education, health, and employment. And a lot of that comes from a lot of personal experience and challenges with the education system, um, challenges with the health system, challenges with you know housing. I, I'm one of those people because my family was in the military, but even after that, um, I can't even count how many times I've moved. Like I literally cannot. I, I actually at one point was thinking I should do a series about doors because I have no idea how many doors I've seen or how many doors I've walked into and how many doors I've had keys to. Um, and so 
Working in the employment education field after Head Start, I started to recognize that my plight was also the plight of others in my community. Um, and that working with um, folks to help them get into college or help them um, get a job, um, become stable and find housing. I did that for about 15 years while I was doing my art practice part time. I finally uh, was able to uh, graduate from Evergreen. <laughs> Um, and this is one of my first pieces that I created right after Evergreen. Um, it's called um, Angels Through the um, Glass, the Looking Glass Ceiling. Um, and so this work really talks a lot about um, being in infrastructures and systems that are uh, non, well, that are traditional, but are industrial place, right? So they were, cre all of our systems were created in the industrial era. And so um, in order to be able to deal with the systems today, you have to have a lot of hope and you have to have a lot of grit and endurance. And so this particular painting was homage to all the angels that got my back when I'm like trying to beat up against the glass ceiling, you know? Um, so this is a piece that I did as soon as I graduated from Evergreen. When I got, when I graduated from Evergreen, I ended up moving to Seattle because I got an AmeriCorps position. And um, AmeriCorps was really great for me in the sense that I'm trying to get it right in the middle of the page. I hope you guys can see that. Um, AmeriCorps was really great for me because it gave me the opportunity. I was a VISTA, which is different than a, uh, AmeriCorps Direct Service and VISTA is um, basically administration and learning how to manage systems and programs. Um, and so I did that for a year and it gave me not only experience in the job world, but it also gave me uh, insight into what happens behind the scenes when people are working with folks who are dealing with trauma or PTSD or unemployment and things like that. Um, and it was a really profound experience for me because I had to live poor, even though I'd grown up, you know, um, with not that much money in middle and high school. Um, so AmeriCorps, I mean, I highly recommend it for anybody. It was a great program. Um, and after I finished AmeriCorps, I ended up getting a job with the YWCA as an employment coach and um ended up becoming the director at a program called the Working Zone. Um, and so I, like I said, I did a lot of that work within the education employment field for about 15 years and um, working with students to really help them figure out what their vision is, what their mission is for their life. Um, and how do you put an action plan together to, to do that? So I like to see like the first half of my art career was really about like learning the techniques of art, learning the tools of art, even though in my heart, I, I was a hippie and I, I was an environmentalist and I still am. Um, I don't think that that was at the forefront of my art at that time. I think in the very beginning, I was really like trying to figure out, okay, what are my images going to look like? What are my, you know, how, how is the compositions going to work? And colors and all of that stuff. And so probably during the middle half of my career as an artist, I started to really look after I got my um, degree from Antioch and really understanding how systems work and fit together. I really started to put that into my art practice models and looking at um, systems in a different way. Um, here's a little bit more of my earlier work. Like I said earlier, um, a lot of my earlier work had a lot to do with me being able to take art and utilize it as a tool to um, express myself, to uh, grapple with concepts that I could not understand. So race and um, identity and um, social structures and stuff like that. Um, and so a lot of my, and, and also spirituality. So the one on the right is named after, I, I did this one when I was nine months pregnant with my daughter, Raven. So it's called Raven. Um, and the one on the left, the two on the left are self-portraits. And I don't really do work like this anymore. Like I used to do a lot of detailed work. I, I kind of strayed from that. I do a lot more abstract work now. Um, is it moving? 
It won't move. There we go. Um, go up a little bit. Yeah. It's going, there we go. So then um, after I started doing work that was really, um, I think I skipped a couple. After I started doing work that was really, wow, I went all the way down, didn't I? <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's really tricky on the Zoom thing because the, the bar is hidden behind the app bar. Um, so this work is based, so in all of the work you just seen is up until about 2010. Um, so what happened around 2010, I met a gallery guy at an art opening and he, we became the best of friends. I mean, he taught me so much about the art world. Um, and he started teaching me monoprint, um, which is uh, the original form of printmaking. Um, you do it by hand, there's no machine, and it's very difficult to do, which is why a lot of people don't do it. And you don't, you only get one print, one to two prints of the same image, whereas with a machine and technology, you can print out, you know, as many as you want, um, or get as many runs is what they call it, as you want. Um, so after I basically uh, started looking at art as a tool and learning a new technique, which was mon monoprints, I started trying to combine painting and monoprints together. And part of this was, had to do with um, researching master painters and how do they, how have they made con contributions to society? And one of the threads that um, is through all of their stories is the stuff that they're doing, they, they've changed something in either their technique, their content, or the structure of the painting that changes the field of art, right? So it's a contribution to the field because it's a point in time in which um, a technique changed or um, certain types of imagery changed, right? And an example of that would be the Mona Lisa. So that painting was the first painting of its kind where there were no lines. All of the painting is painted with really um, smooth um, structure and which is why it looks like she's smiling or she's looking at you. And that was the first time that had ever been done in painting. So I wanted to, that was like a goal. I was like, I want to do something that I can actually um, transform people's minds, not only about painting, but what it means to be a painter, right? And so I started playing with this idea of um, mono prints and paintings. And these are the first, some of the first ones that I did. Um, the one on the left is a tree at Green Lake. And then the one on the right, it's called Ring Around the Rosies. And it's basically about contemporary current day African-American children playing ring around the rosies around a tree, not recognizing that hundreds of years ago, um, somebody was lynched in that tree. Um, so I like to play with these different concepts in terms of, um, you know, past, present, future, and spirituality in terms of ethics and morals, right? And so I started playing with these, these concepts in these paintings. So the next, <laughs> after doing that, I was actually in 2012 trained through the Seattle Parks and Recs as a um, urban forest educator because I love trees. I've always loved trees. I grew up around trees. Um, and I think we have some of the most beautiful trees in the world. Um, and so I paint a lot of trees. <laughs> And I really believe in the tree of life and um, especially the definition that comes from Africa in terms of um, the boba tree. They believe that that tree gives life to all things, you know, in the ground, in the air, um, even, you know, just walking by it, the leaves and the animals and the birds and just everything about a tree is, is, is beautiful, right? And because they're older than we are, um, 
I see them as our ancestors. I see them as beings that have been around for a very long time that have seen things that we have not seen and we are not paying attention to. Um, and so after really starting to play around with this idea of painting and a print together, I started deciding to really look into um, environmental art in a way to talk about race as a resource, right? Especially as an African-American. And, and at this time I started to really also, I mean, I didn't really start to really understand African-American history until I was like 35, 40 years old. And so, um, and even I'm still scratching the surface of, of, of history around all of that because none of, when I was a kid, none of that was taught in school. There was no black history month. There was none of that. So I, I it took me a minute to catch up. Um, but with that said, I started playing with this concept of environment and climate change, not only in terms of, you know, the world heating up um, and global catastrophes. I started looking at it through the lens of resources. And then I started taking a checklist of my life and of the times that I had resources, of the times I didn't have resources, of the times that... Um, you know, I wished I would have had resources, right? Uh, and I started putting all of this into my painting. And so the painting on the left is um, called Artifacts from the Future. And it's actually a part of a five piece series um, about what would my ancestors say to me um, if they could in the future, looking back at me now, right? And that's the one on the left. The one in the middle is actually, um, was auctioned, I think in 2013, and it is a part of a three-part series. So it's actually a triptych. This is just one of them, but this is one of the first monoprint trees. So you can definitely see <laughs> the difference in years. Like the one on the left is like five years, maybe five or maybe even more, five or six or eight years. Uh, after the one in the middle. So I really started to hone the technique even more and more. Um, but the one in the middle is a tree at Evergreen State College that stands right by the clock tower. Um, and then the one on the right is a painting that is also a triptych and it's about six feet by five feet. No, it's six feet, six feet by eight feet. Um, and this tree I did, uh, was also called um, Artifacts from the Future and it represents my ancestors and what they would give me to preserve my culture in the future. And so at the root, there are all of these things that are imperative to African-American life. So there's, and there's stuff that, you know, I think there's a paintbrush cause I'm a painter. <laughs> um, so I started to play around with these concepts. How can I actually incorporate and tell the story of African-Americans being a resource and that mentality being the same mentality that created climate change? So I started to really um, delve deep into that and I started to do um, paintings that were really just about climate change and environmental um, devastation. And so this one's called Climate Warrior. Um, I think that, oops, I went up too far. Sorry again. Had to go up a little bit. Whoops. It's tricky, this little thing. Um, and so this one um, is, is um, it's basically three, it's two angels. One angel is um, hanging around the climate warrior's neck and her wings are the necklace, the beads. And then the other angel, of course, is the big yellow one that's hugging the climate warrior. And then there are endangered species throughout. So there's a polar bear at the bottom. Um, there's a red squirrel, there's an elephant, there's all kinds of animals in there. Um, so this is one piece where I was just really trying to do that. Um, more climate, more climate work. Um, and this piece um, is also is one of my older pieces, but this is also when I started also playing with models and playing with the concept of art to teach about environment and change. Um, and so this one is called Paradigm Shift, and it is actually a city with um, people inside looking out the windows that 
have actually ascended. So they're spiritual beings and they've ascended and they're working to save the trees that are on the outside of this building. And the people on the outside of the building are, uh, you know, doing bad things and hurting each other and not really invested in climate change. Um, and they're birch trees. And throughout this painting, they're endangered eagles. So there's eagles hidden throughout the whole thing. Um, let me see, where are we at for time? Okay, cool. Um, so this piece was my very first large scale monoprint. And um, it actually just got sold. So you guys will be able to see it at the convention center. I just dropped it off today. Um, and this piece I started also, because I do a, Evergreen State College, their art program is conceptual. So I do a lot of conceptual art. <laughs> Um, and combined with Antioch, I, I, I like the models as well. And so with this piece, I created an actual model that explains the piece. And it's based on um, the idea that the tree could represent humanity and that if the roots represent like all these negative things like rape, um, greed, genocide, um, trauma, slavery, our histories, then the trunk could possibly represent the things that we would need to change those things and make them bloom into better ways. And some of those things would be sustainable food systems, um, vision, right? Education around healthcare and housing, um, utilizing our voice to speak up and to be able to speak on things that are not equal, um, allowing all of us to tell our story, not just his stories, but looking at her stories and leadership in a completely different way. And so that's what this painting represents. The roots are, are, are um, seeped in blood and the trunk is, well, the rest of it, of course, is the model print. This piece was actually commissioned by Evergreen State College in 2020. I completed it and right when I was just about to give it to them, COVID hit. <laughs> so I still have it. <laughs> they don't want it, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, it was great because I, I made it because it was commissioned, so I made it. Um, and it's called The Four Elements. And this is a really great example of um, how far I've come in terms of being able to mix images with um, painting. And so this, it's actually one long painting. It's about seven feet by four feet, I think. It's a pretty big piece. Um, it's actually four paintings. The first painting is all about fire. The second painting is all about air. The second, the third painting is about water. And the fifth painting is about earth. And what it is, is a African-American girl emoji with her huge black Afro in the background. And you can see her two eyes like at the very front of the bottom of the painting in the middle. Um, so she's looking out on this world where there's fires, there's hurricanes, there's flooding, and the earth is being shredded, you know, where the trees are coming out. Um, and throughout each one of the paintings, so like the fire painting, um, there are birds, you can't really see it in here, um, unfortunately, but um, there are birds that are flying away from the fire. Um, th and there's animals all throughout, there's bats and, and and polar bears and every, there's all kinds of animals in this painting. But the whole part of the painting is that there's also four angels that you cannot see. You can see one kind of in the first one and they the angels start to fade all the way through the fourth one, but they're there, they're in the end. Um, so this is an example of some of the work that, um, this is pretty much my current work, um, looking at environment, and resources um, in terms of how they actually affect animals. So my work went from being introspective to outerspective to actually taking action with other people to now being a catalyst, not only for taking action for other people, but for education and educating folks on the environment. This is also a piece of my current work that um, I created. So in 
2018, I started to branch out of painting and I started to branch into public art. And so I created this performance piece that's called The Plague of Healing. Um, and it, it was created in 2020 during COVID. Um, hence the masks I wanted. To, and since I grew up in Germany and I witnessed Carnival, I wanted um, some form of, you know, identity where people wouldn't be able to know who you were. Um, and so I picked out these white masks because they reminded me of the Ku Klux Klan. And I really wanted to like push it home. So the hoodies actually, this project um, was really amazing. We had um, seven seamstress costume designers volunteer their time pro bono for two months. I dyed, hand dyed a bunch of fabric pieces and then handed them to, handed them out to the seven of them. They helped me to write all the names of African American folks who were killed by the police on these um, pieces of fabric. And they sewed 40, no, we ordered 60 hoodies. They sewed um, 60 hoodies together with all these um, fabric pieces on them. And the idea was that um, the African-American community needs a plague of healing as opposed to, um, you know, punishments, right? <laughs> um, I'm trying to go up again, sorry guys. This is like really weird. I don't know how to get rid of this box in the corner. Um, I wanted to show you that because there's a close up. Come on, come on. <laughs> There it is. Okay. So this is the close up and you can see they have the names on them. So this was um, a perform after we created all of it, then I put out an art call and I just put in, I put it like, I think it was in the newspaper, it was in the stranger. Um, and I put a call out to community and I basically said, we need 40 participants. Do you know how to dance? If you don't know how to dance, I'll teach you, just follow the leader. And it was basically a follow the leader performance. Um, and there's an artist intern resident that's currently working with me and she's putting all the videography together right now so that we can actually share it with the public. Um, but it was really cool. 40 people showed up at Jimi Hendrix Park and we were all spread out and it was crazy looking. <laughs> it was so cool. Um, but this is another piece that um, I did basically to bring more awareness to uh, African-American uh, brutality um, from the police. So like I said, in 2018, I started to branch out into public art. And one of my first sculptures was this tambourine piece. And the tambourine is basically a, it comes from um, my upbringing. So, my mother was a Pentecost was Pentecostal. I grew up in a Pentecostal household, and um, in the Pentecostal religion, all women have a tambourine. And when that person dies, the tambourine is given to the daughter. And so, um, in 2015, I think it is. Yeah, I think it was 2015. My mother passed away, and I inherited her tambourine. So in 2018. Um, I applied for a commission and got it and built the tambourine in honoring in honoring my mother. Um, but I wanted it to be engagement in a way that people could actually hear it and play it. And so um, I it, it was really fun. <laughs> um, we took the 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 symbols from drums, um, which is what you see on it. And then it uh, has words all over it that are hopeful and inspirational. And people can play on it. Kids can jump on it. Um, right now, it was actually um, acquired by the Evergreen State College. So if you wanna see it, that one is actually in um, the student resource building, I think. Yeah. So. After I started doing public art, I also started doing more murals in community with um, community. So this mural is over in Hillman City in South Seattle. And it was a project that I did with 16 um, high school students and also one other artist, um, Devin Mandari Hale. Um, and it was a summer project. The students got paid, um, but we also invited the community to come in and help paint certain portions. And so 
that was a really fun mural. So I do a lot of um, mural around belonging and that's what this was. Um, pretty much doing a painting to help people feel comfortable coming into the neighborhood. Um, this is another one of my current pieces that is specifically about the environment. Um, this piece is called Water um, and it's in a private collection in West Seattle. Um, and it's a large scale monoprint. Um, and basically it is, I, I created this piece off of an article that I read in, when did I read that article? I think it was like uh, 2019, 2018, 2019. And the article is really interesting because it actually was the first time that science figured out that not only do trees feed each other, but trees heal each other, literally, like they heal. So when they're giving nutrients um, through their roots to each other, they're also, if there's a tree like a mile away that's hurting, another tree a mile away can send a message to a different tree and be like, we're gonna heal you all together. Um, and so that's what this painting was about. It was about really capturing this, um, identity of the tree in a completely different way. And I wanted to really um, look at water because water is such a valuable resource and especially in the coming years with water um, scarcity. I wanted to make a piece that um, kind of had the breadth of what water means to all of us, right? So there are people playing in water, right? There are people squandering water, people managing water, people um, walking. There's a boy in here. He's got a water bucket on his head and he's walking miles to get water. Um, there's a water pump. There's all kinds of uh, water images in this piece. Um, yeah, that was, that's the water. Thing. <laughs> um, and then this painting is one of my most recent works. It also just got sold. Um, and it is actually, um, it, it was, I don't know yet if people are going to be able to see it publicly, but I'm thinking you can. It was bought by an environmental, international environmental law firm downtown Seattle, and it's already hung. It's already there. Um, this piece is called Containment, and basically it is about our um, passion, <laughs> As human beings to try to contain nature and to try to like manage those resources right um yet not recognizing i don't know if you guys can see it but they're in the top right hand corner and there's a detail of it at the bottom of the image in the top right hand corner there's some kind of bee bug fly that has been um genetically altered and now he's stinging the human that's walking out of the Garden of Eden, right? So this is, it's, it's almost representative of the Garden of Eden where we've like really boxed in everything and we want to control everything. <laughs> but yet what we don't recognize is that we have no control. Right? So that's what um, this painting is all about. And I think that's my last painting. Yeah, that's the last painting. And then that's me. So I also do installation work. I do a lot of, this one was called um, The Tree Forest. Um, and it was based on symbols and um, identity labels in African-American culture. Um, so that's my work, basically. I also do, um, I have products. I do products. So I do, um, designer gear, I have clothing and stuff, and just kind of getting one of the things that, um, yeah, so this, my gear, um, one of the things that I've really tried to do a lot of research on is how do I utilize resources that are sustainable, and so one example is my Oracle cards that just came out last year, um, I don't know if there's a quick view, It'll pop up. Yeah. Um, 
So they are actually made with eco herbage paper. And I don't know if you guys know what eco herbage paper is, but eco herbage paper, instead of actually cutting down more trees, it's actually where they use the foliage from plants that are deteriorating and they use that to make the paper. Um, and so I've really been looking at not only like um, part of the reason I'm branching out a lot more is because I'm looking at not only the way I make my art now, but also how I can utilize whatever I'm using in my everyday life to upscale it or recycle it or some, you know, bring it to fruition in a different way. So with that said, that brings me to BIPOC stack. <laughs> Um, so in 2020, well, actually, I've been thinking about housing for artists for a very long time. Let me see what time is it. Okay, cool. Um, I've been thinking about housing for a very long time, and I actually wanted to live in a tree house forever um, until I realized that there really aren't any trees in Seattle that I could do that in. So <laughs> I decided uh, that I would have to figure out a new community model. Um, and so in 2020, I um, was diagnosed with autoimmune disease and basically couldn't leave the house, all the virus um, of 2020. And I had this idea that I wanted to provide housing for my family and housing for my friends. And I had been a consultant um, on numerous projects around housing and building art space equitably, right? Um, and one of the things that I noticed was that 80 to 90% of my friends, art friends had left the city because they could no longer afford to live here. And so that started getting me to thinking about what would it take to keep artists in the city, but keep them viable, right? Um, and a lot of the times what people don't understand, it's not that artists aren't making money, um, there are a lot of successful artists in this city that make a livable, they're doing really great on their art careers and they're and making a great income. Um, it's an outdated model that we have in terms of thinking about art artists as starving. Um, there are so many more possibilities and opportunities for artists today than there ever have been. Um, the challenge is that we have not changed our systems in terms of housing, and we have not changed our systems in terms of access, opportunities, and resources for artists. So what do I mean by that? Um, in 2010, I um, created a model called um, the School to um, College Pipeline, Art School to College Pipeline. And what I've figured out after doing all that research is that um, low income communities and communities of color do not have a lot of access to artists, um, especially in the school setting or in a professional setting. Um, and when we're talking about visual art, I'm speaking specifically about visual art. Um, and so if, if kids don't have access to art, in elementary, middle school, or high school, chances are they're not gonna take it in college. But now the problem is that even college art schools are closing down, right? So now you don't have artists that can even get masters in fine arts. And it's hard to get an art, um, like an official art gig if you don't have a master's in art. So that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of people of color um, in the visual art field because of access, exposure, and resources. Um, one of the things I wanted to change is I wanted to look at housing as an asset. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> what I mean is everybody has their own concept and idea about what a house is and what a home is. Where you want to live and where I want to live may be very different. Just because you want to live in an apartment building with 60 people or 150 people or 350 people, you should be allowed to do that. And it should be affordable for you at some level, right? Everybody should be able to live how they want. Um, for me, I do not agree with density. Um, 
I think that in the future, when we start having water shortages and we start having electrical outages and all of that stuff, if you're not either off the grid or tied in a way that you can um, support and develop your own resources, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. <laughs> so I don't believe in density. So this model is not based on density. It's based on quality and it's based on um, community engagement. And so there's two pieces to it. Um, there's the hiring piece and how BIPOC stack actually hires um, its staff. Um, and then the other piece is our programming and our housing, and what does that actually mean? So we've partnered with an agency called Arch Cabins, who has a company in Texas, and they build the exterior, which lasts the length of a traditional home. And all of their tiny homes include a bathroom, a living room, a kitchen, and a bedroom. And they range anywhere from eight to 12 feet to 30 by 40 feet. So you can actually, the biggest one is a three bedroom with a full-size kitchen, right? Um, and so that was one of my main goals was how do I create housing that's affordable for folks who are middle to low income? How do I create a model that works in the zoning and planning situation here in Seattle? And so one of the things that I found out was that the only way that I could create it was that I had to consider tiny homes as an additional dwelling unit, which meant that um, you have to have a main house in order on the land in order to build anything around that house. And so what I did is I flipped it inside out. Instead of folks living in the main house, the main house becomes a residence center. And there is a consultant that does live there called the um, site managing consultant. But in terms of um, how the space is utilized, um, it's, a uh, co-working space, event space, workshop space, residency space, um, gardening space, um, all of that. Anything that an artist would need to do. Um, and then the other part of the model with the hiring piece of it um, has to do more with uh, how we work together with other people. And um, I came across a model called um, sociocracy. I also, um, I, I, I like the model. I'm not really sure how it would work in like real life. I've seen some videos around it. I really, I really like that model. Um, I'm not really big on consensus. I don't think it works. Um, and so the model that we have here at BIPAC Stack is everyone's interviewed for almost three hours. Um, I barely ever look at anybody's resume. Um, I really, um, assess where they've come from, where they're at, and where they want to go. Um, all of, every single one of us, there is no executive director. Um, I'm a consultant just like everybody else on my team, on our team, um, and we're all paid the same rate. Um, and that was one, that was something that was really important to me was pay. I want people to make a livable wage, a real livable wage. Um, and so everybody that's hired onto our team comes from our community. Um, and it's more like the very first year, it's like a job shadowing training piece of it because I'm assessing. So here's an example, my current consultant, she wants to learn all about curating, but she can't get her foot in the door. So she comes to me, comes with me to all my meetings. You know, um, she attends um, the the Columbia Hillman Art District. I just got on the board for the Columbia um, Hillman Art District. So she attends those with me so that she can have access, right? And so that she can learn from people who are actually doing this work. Um, and mainstream America, that is a, it's very challenging to do that because most, most companies and organizations don't want you to bring somebody with you, right? Um, but sometimes that's the only way that people in communities of color get access is if you bring them with you. And so that, that's a huge piece of the, the, the hiring process is where are you at right now? Where do you wanna go? And I'm gonna provide all the resources that I can to help you get there. Um, part of the reason we're able to sell housing, any so our houses will sell from 50 to um, 
$100,000. And part of the reason we're able to do that is because um, our labor, we work with youth builds and we also work with, um, uh, sorry. So there's the labor part of it. And then we also work with, um, oh, Homestead, I think that's the name of it, Homestead, the land trust. So we're looking at all of the properties that we purchase to put them into a community land trust so that they stay that way and that that part of um, the neighborhood does not get gentrified or redeveloped any time in the future so that my kids and their kids, if they need a place to stay, they have a place to stay. Um, and so that is really um, the model of BIPOC stock. And it came about um, honestly because of um, all of the, the displacement that's happening in the city and people not being able to afford a house. Um, I just, I just think it's really critical that we start to build systems that work with the environment. So um, our models, they're tied, grid tied and um, not grid tied. Um, we also have one artist, she's in DC and she really wants one to be on wheels. So the model is highly flexible, right? Because you gotta meet people where they're at. And that to me is critical, it's important. And um, that's BIPOC stock, yeah. <laughs> I think Great. that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carol. That was fantastic. Thank you. I just I want to be respectful of, of your time and, and the students' time. It's uh, I think just about five thirty. So what I'm going to do is just once again thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to end the live.